Come on, can we give it up for what God did at Collide Conference? So good. Hey, can I read you something that'll encourage you? I got this from one of our other campus pastors this morning uh, over in Fort Smith. His name's Brandon. Listen to what some of the students there said uh, as they were talking about their decisions for Christ. One of them said, this weekend I opened up to Christ and I accepted him in my life. They were, they were writing these things down on their, on their cards. Uh, here's another one. I had a lot of guilt from previous actions that I prayed for this weekend and felt God's forgiveness. Man, that's so good. Oh, here's, a, here's another good one. This weekend, this is a student writing this. This weekend, Christ revealed to me that he is always with me and will help me with anything. Come on, y'all. Give it up for God. What did he, what, what's he doing in the students, man? Um, today is going to be very, very different. First of all, I feel like junk, so um, there's that. Uh, I have the crud, and uh, by the way, so I'm sick. Uh, Michael's just hung over from Collide, and then Chuck, he's a, he's a cripple now, so so we, uh, we, we I'm just going to tell you, this is what I think. God has something very special planned today, and uh, we've already experienced some of his presence in worship, uh, but also... Another reason why it's different is that Kamani and I, we just returned from Brazil. We took a team with us to go visit the church we planted there in the year 2000, and uh, we returned there. Uh, we, we go back there routinely, but this was a, a, a special trip. In fact, I want to show you the team that went with us. Can you give them a hand? Look at those guys. I was greatly encouraged by this trip, but also by this team. They represented you so well in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. We had eight students and eight, eight adults, and it was awesome. I uh, love to have all that. And God also gave me a word for our church here, you guys, while I was there. And uh, it has a lot to do with what we saw there. But also, we've been in this uh, series called Kings, Queens, and Prophets. So I'm also going to show you some of this in one of the kings. His name is King Asa. He was a king of Judah. And you can find his story in 2 Chronicles 14, 15, and 16. So you might want to turn over there, but I'll just briefly, a couple of verses I'm going to hit on. But it's funny because we had our own king on this trip with us. How many of y'all heard of King Julian? It was a cartoon called Madagascar. Yeah, so one of our students, where's Daxon? Daxon, raise your hand. Daxon, stand up so everybody can see you. This is King Julian. Man, he does this impression so well. And uh, shall I let y'all hear it? Come here. He didn't know I was doing this. Come here. This is, I just want you to know, this is what we heard the entire trip. Come on. Y'all give it up for King Julian here. Just give us whatever you want to tell us, King. I know everybody. My name is King Julian. Where's my people at today? Come on. Come on. Get loud. Get loud with it. Yeah. All right, that's enough. Thanks, King. So this is what we had the entire trip. And, uh, man, he was comic relief, and we appreciated it. it got everybody laughing. And uh, I was so proud of all these guys. So I'm also going to give you an update on what's happening uh, at the church there in Brazil. Um, but let me just say this right out the gate. You know, cultures are different around the world. That means that churches are different around the world as well. And, uh, listen, we can learn from churches around the world. Not everything from every culture is good. Some of it's straight up bad. But... We can learn something from all cultures. And uh, frankly, we, right here in Arkansas, believers, listen to me, we need some of what the Brazilian believers have. And let me tell you what it is, passion. Now, I may not be able to get you from like zero to 100, okay? Because, you, you know, I mean, let's face it, they start off a little higher than we do. But I might be able to get you a couple of steps ahead, amen? Because passion for God, oh my gosh, every time I go there, I'm reminded of how much we should be loving God in our worship, in our prayer, in, in the way that we approach the word. They just love it. There's a joy in these people. They don't have much, and they're like, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And they really have it, not like us faking it until we make it. I'm talking about joy. Anybody in here? Y'all are too quiet. <laughs> By the way, the first service, I told everybody this. I said, man, I'm full of decongestant. I'm full of meds, so this could go one or two ways. Uh, I could be angry preacher, or I could be really loopy, all right? And I think somewhere in between is what we got in the first service. Uh, Tyler, he's working the cameras. He said, man, I like spicy James. <laughs> he didn't say it like that. <laughs> 
But there was one word I used last, uh, last, last service that I had to apologize for. Because, come on, it got all over me. So anyway, all right, I want to read something to you real quick. We're talking about passion. Here's what I saw in Brazil, the church there. Uh, it's Psalm 96. Y'all listen to this. Listen, let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. How many of y'all live on the earth? Some of y'all, some of y'all do. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. Who in here is part of creation? Come on. We are the premier. We're like the, the first of his creation. We are the masterpiece of God's creation. And it says, it says, let all creation rejoice before the Lord. For he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He'll judge the world in righteousness and the people's in his faithfulness. Man, some of y'all don't remember this back in the day. Ron Canoli. Y'all don't know who Ron Canoli is. You're way too white. That's why you don't know who Ron Canoli is. But man, I'm going to tell you what. He used to sing this song. If I don't praise, man, listen, the rocks are going to shout out. And he said, I'm not going to let no rock out praise me. Amen? Give the Lord a hand. Come on. Passion for Jesus, man. So I'm going to uh, show you some pictures because they're worth a thousand words, right? And I'll save us some time. I'm going to be like old Papa pulling out all the old photos from the attic and getting the eight millimeter reels down, you know. So I've got some videos and photos of the trip. Rio de Janeiro, first of all, is a place full of natural beauty. You'll see that here. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, Rio is unbelievably beautiful. And I know as we're tracking through those, you, some of y'all are thinking, man, I feel led to go to Rio next year. I'm just, I just really feel like I need to go there and suffer for Christ. Um, but not only is it beautiful, we got to do a lot of praying for people. Like the church there, they get into these neighborhoods and they just pray for people. And uh, I think we have a video of, uh, of my son taking some food. Look at this. We did a lot of this right yes, here. They are. Bringing some food up to people. And uh, we work with the church. They know who, need, who, need, who needs food. We get up there and then we pray for them. And it was so awesome. And uh, we got a lot of photos of us doing that here. Uh, that home right there, if we just pause. The home we're in right there was the home that we started our first life group in that church uh, in the year 2000. We were there, um, barely speaking the language. That woman in the back right there, uh, is Simone, she's still with the church, faithful. She used to live in that house. Now she rents it to another family. And that man, the dad on the floor, he's, he's just receiving prayer, but he's got his phone up in there. He's recording what's going on because the Lord was giving him a word. I said the Lord, the Holy Spirit gave him a word. He was discouraged all week. We showed up there, and then he's like, I got to record this. And he was in tears, and his family was there. We were laying hands on them. Are y'all with me? This is the body of Christ, okay? And uh, so more things we did. If you keep going, we were just taking over the streets. I was praying. We were praying over. That's the leader of the community right there. And there was a divine appointment happening. And uh, pray, prayed for him. Who else? We got this next one. Well, we're just taking over right there. We, <laughs> yeah, taking it to the streets. Okay, uh, here, here we're uh, praying over a guy named Kleber, and he's a friend of mine uh, from way back when. Our friends were showing us around, and uh, I got to pray for him. He's a business owner. He's a barber in the area. And then here we were praying for some, some young people. They were playing soccer, but we taught them how to play baseball. Now, that's fun watching Brazilians learn baseball. Um, but the cool thing is we got to pray for them and for their soccer coaches. and for all, It's just wonderful. And that, that is going to be a regular thing now, I think, with, uh, with the church there and that group. There's some more praying over people in, in, in a home. What else? This, this man, so precious. This was the one that, that you saw earlier my son Philip was bringing the food to. This is, this is typical of what we got to do. They're so precious and so ready to receive prayer. I love it. But uh, we did a lot of that, but we also helped them with a youth conference when we were there. And uh, we, we had our youth conference here. Man, you talk about some of these people that were on our Brazil trip turned around and went to Collide when they got back. But we had a youth conference there called Brave. And uh, we got some photos of that. Over 350 students attended. There's our very own Michael Hogue teaching a session at Brave. Man, he looks serious. Look at him. He's like, oh, you are going to get saved. And uh, in Jesus' name. <laughs> a couple more photos there, I think. Yep, there I am taking a shameless selfie with 350 students. There's that. It was so incredible. I think we have a video or a couple of videos. This is the, this is the beginning of the conference. 
You see some of our kids in there too. There's Brandy's thrill. Oh my goodness. And then look at this. Check them out worshiping in this conference. These are students praising the name of Jesus. Look at the. If you don't get excited about that, I'm just telling you right now, this is the next generation in Brazil. They're, they're, they're talking about Jesus being the most high name, the, the highest, the best name ever. Hey, love it, man. This is just like, it's like Collide Conference Brazilian style is what's going on there. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about their Dream Center because the Dream Center they started there is meeting the needs uh, of people, but they're really helping people help themselves. And I love that. The gospel has a lot to say about that, uh, personal responsibility. And, uh, oh, my goodness, they've got these. There's a lot of things I could talk about. But they've got these courses, professional development courses now, that they offer for free to people in this area that's full of need. And uh, they do them these terms twice a year, semesters, really. And when they open it up, they, they graduated 150 while we were there. And they, they do things like teach people how to be electricians. They teach people how to do, uh, do a lot of beauty things like nails and eyebrows. Some of y'all need that, I guess. And, uh, you know, makeup, makeup artists, all these kind of things. Things to help them earn money and help their families. Okay, professional skills. And y'all check it out. When one of these uh, terms ends and the new one opens up, people line up around the block to get in. Uh, check it out. This is the line. Some of them camp out overnight to get in this line because first come, first, come, first serve. I, I don't know how many people are in this line, but y'all, that's incredible. This is the reputation, though, that the body of Christ, the church there, has been known for this now. We're helping people better themselves, helping people earn money for their families. And look at this. This blows me away. Man, can you give God a hand for that right there? That's... By the way, that's been a dream of ours to do here in this church, but they're doing it. They're past the dreaming stage. They're doing it. I think they've graduated like 900-something people out of that particular uh, course, those courses. And then we, we went to a lot of church services while we were there, a lot of church services. I think we have some photos of our, our students actually gave testimonies in some of their services. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then there's also another one of an international speaker giving a great word to, uh, <laughs> to one of their campuses. <laughs> Check out this worship. Y'all, check it out. Look at this next video. This is in uh, the Campo Garanji campus, or like Michael says, their Krampus. That dude on the left right there, he looks just like Jesus when his hair is down. I was following Jesus the whole trip. Look at these guys, man. Come on, man. Your name is above all names they're talking about. Gosh. Wow, you can see our guys getting in there with it. It's so cool. Listen to me. Uh, Y'all know this, that one day, one day we won't need translators. One day, listen to me, we will all speak the same language, the language of heaven, and heaven will be on earth again, and we'll all be together. Yes, when I told them that, they did the same thing. One day, amen? But let me tell you the story of, of the early days of the church there we planted, because some of you don't know this. I think it's a good time to talk about that. And then I want to talk to you about what's happening there now. We saw a little bit of it. Kamani and I, we moved our family from Baton Rouge to Rio de Janeiro in 2000. And uh, we were helping our friends Philip and Renee Murdoch uh, to plant the church. Uh, it's called Light to the Nations Church in English. In Portuguese, it's Igreja Luz as Nações. Why don't you say that? No, nah, forget about it. Um, but uh, I think we have a photo of the Murdochs with us at a restaurant here recently when we were there. I looked, man. I tried to get a picture from the old days, but, y'all, I couldn't find any. We didn't have iPhones back then. I mean, how in the world did anybody record anything? I mean, we, 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 we couldn't. I don't know how we survived, really. Uh, but Philip Murdoch and I met in college at LSU. We were both in engineering there. And uh, then he went on to become the administrator of our church, Bethany, uh, in Baton Rouge, and it was always his dream to go back to his home, Rio. I know he doesn't look like he's from there, but he always had that dream from God to go plant a life-giving church there, and so we felt called by God to help them, and we did, and uh, listen, we, Kamani and I, would still be there today if we believed that God wanted us to be there today, but God had other ideas and moved us on in 2003 uh, to come and plant this church, New Life Church, but, uh, man, the early years there were tough sledding. Let me tell you, 
Just like when you start anything, a new endeavor, it's always so hard in the beginning. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Um, some of you business owners, you understand this. Planting a church is the same, especially when you show up, you don't know anything. You don't know the language. I, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. One time, Kamani and I, we were leading uh, the young adults at, uh, at the church when we started. And we were in this one small group, and I was leading. And I thought I was saying some prof- profound stuff, you know. And uh, I was trying to explain that we should soak up everything that God has for us, right? And, uh, and the word I used was absorvange. And so people started falling about the place. I mean, they were laughing. I'm like, what's going on, man? I thought this was like revelation from God, you know. And they explained to me why they were laughing. They said that what I actually told them was that we should be feminine hygiene products for God. <laughs> Get you some of that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, by the way, that was the least of our issues <laughs> because... Half the time, we didn't have a place to meet. We moved from place to place. Um, but let me tell you about what's happening now. And this is where I'm going to turn the corner here. And I'm going to show you this in the Word, okay? Around 2017, so it was tough sledding, right? I mean, for a long time. Around 2017, we had been here for a long time. The, they, the Murdochs and, and, and Light to the Nation started, I think, their third campus in Campo Grande. Uh, and they started uh, to meet needs in that community. Okay, so what God started doing from then on, it was like just a domino effect. And I'm just going to tell you, God's timing and his sovereignty, it blows me away. Because they have grown in that time from 2017 until the present day. They have like 10 campuses, 7,500 people meeting in attendance on the weekends. And, oh, and like over 30 schools they've started. A dream center that I've already told you about. They have so much influence. They are now the leading church in the Association of Related Churches, the ARC, in Brazil. And I'm just telling you all, Philip has some guys in that church that would kill somebody for him. And I think they may already have. I, okay. <laughs> I'm not joking. Brazil, it just hits different than the United States, okay? Uh, but listen to what Jesus said all about that. Y'all, y'all, listen to this. This is so important. Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. A mustard seed is really small. If you ever seen one, you can barely see it. Like, it's just in your hand, you can't find it. He said, it's a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Somebody's got to plant it. A man took and planted it, right? Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, everybody say say this, it grows. It's talking about the kingdom of heaven. It's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. And so I was thinking during this trip, it's amazing to me, now I can see it, the light to the nation's church. And then I think about our church, New Life Church, how it starts small. Man, this is how the kingdom works. And, and then it grows. It's grown now. Both of our churches there in Brazil, here in Arkansas, have grown. It's not only trees, but like mighty forests for God. And uh, the only difference is in their trees, they got monkeys, we got squirrels, you know. Um, but the three years, listen to me, the three years that my family spent there working hard was not wasted. And all the time, the Murdochs and other faithful people spent hard work. Man, it's like the floodgates are open now, and heaven is blessing them, and he's doing a mighty work. And even though we couldn't see it, right, couldn't see it with our eyes, God was cooking behind the scenes the whole time. That's a word for somebody. You might not be able to see it. Hey, the same has been true here in Arkansas. When we started this campus, like we moved from tough sledding in Brazil to tough sledding in Arkansas. Because we showed up here, and we didn't know anybody, and we started the campus of New Life Church here in Heber Springs, and I don't have time to get into all that, but it was hard. It was hard. Uh, started with like, you know, three people, <laughs> or whatever it was, a handful of families, and uh, I was working as an engineer in Little Rock, commuting, just hard. Uh, but see, it's easy. You all, every one of you can see it now. You don't need faith. You don't need vision at all. You don't need anything. You just walk in here, you see it. You see it. You can do that in Brazil. When I go over there, whether I knew the early days or not, I could just see that God is doing something. It's obvious. You couldn't see it back then. And it took a few people to believe that God was going to do something. It was called vision back then. Spiritual vision. Are you all with me right now? Listen to me. Listen, those days, though, 
they're not wasted. Those, those, and, and, and let me tell you what, the way this all happened is very predictable. It's not random. Oh, I can tell some of y'all don't believe that. You're like, oh, well, sometimes people got success. Oh, no. Success in God's kingdom is predictable. Amen. What I'm not saying is, is, is that success is having a big ministry or a big church. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying absolutely is that God is good. God is powerful. Listen to me. And God wants to and will do something supernatural in your life and through your life to reach people with the life-giving message of his son Jesus to help them become fully devoted to him. That is what I'm telling you. And that is success in the kingdom. That's what God wants for all of us. It's not automatic, is it? But it is predictable. And you know how you can predict it? Two-question test. This is where I want to go today. Y'all ready for this? Let's write these down. Two questions. I think all of our life with God centers around these two questions. And you know what? I want you to be super uncomfortable today. We have never been a church that says, man, let's just come in here and be all comfortable and be all. We want a church that, that invites everybody in and you feel comfortable about coming. But once you get in here, we want the presence of God to shake you up, man, to challenge you, right? Say, hey, you know what? There's some things that I got for you, and you're not, you haven't experienced them yet. God's saying, hey, let's walk in those things. Are y'all with me so far? It is way too quiet in here. Somebody clap. Somebody say Jesus something. My gosh, man. I, it is hard coming from Brazil to come to Arkansas. Let me just say that. All right. <laughs> Again, all right. So two questions. These are really two thoughts that were stirred up in me when I was in Brazil, and I can't get away from them. And it really explains the massive momentum in Brazil and the massive momentum we've had ever since Pastor Rick and Michelle have hit the ground running in Arkansas. So number one is, write it down. This is big for you. Do I rely on God? Do I rely on God? Write in parentheses, faith. That's what this is talking about. I didn't ask if you believe God. How many of y'all believe God? Come on, he writes something in the Word. You believe what he says, right? You're believers. That's why we're, we're believers, therefore we believe God. But that's a little bit different. And this trip, this trip was a faith builder for me. But it was kind of like this. Do I still believe God like when I moved to Brazil and when I moved here? Like that's, those are big steps. Well, is that still the way that I rely on God? Probably not as much as I used to, if I'm honest. Maybe some of you can th think of some instances in your life where, man, you... You really had faith in God, uh, but maybe not so much now. I love that quote that I heard. We heard it in the video from Collide. Ellen said it this way. When we get into God's presence, we remember, listen, that God knows some stuff we don't. And he can do things that we can't. Man, I love that about God. And prayer week, guys, is coming. We do this every year. Prayer week is coming. It's starting August 25th. But we're doing it differently here at this campus than we've ever done it before. Because for three nights, the 25th, 26th, and 27th, we're going to have uh, worship and prayer right here in this building. All right? Now, we're not calling it, calling it revival meetings. You can't plan a revival. Imagine that. Uh, no, no. But, uh, I know some of your denominational backgrounds are different. But listen, that's like a camp meeting or something. But I'm telling you right now, it's going to feel like revival because we're going to praise God and we're going to pray okay, together, and then because for the rest of the week, we're turning you loose, man. We're taking it to the streets. You're going to be prayer walking, prayer driving, and we're going to have all of you praying over your neighborhoods. It's going to be great. And listen, we're going to do that all over the state. Come on, y'all. We're going to take this state for Jesus and kick the devil out of our neighborhoods, out of our businesses, out of our families, out of our schools. Are y'all with me? But you don't have to wait till prayer week to believe God. You don't have to wait till prayer week to rely on God, to have faith in him. Let me show you. I mentioned King Asa. I think I did already. Uh, 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 this guy, he was the king of Judah for, for, a, for a time. He was a good king. But this guy had some, uh, s some real opportunities to rely on the Lord. He had this massive army coming against him. And uh, look in 2 Chronicles 14. Let's start in verse 11. Like he didn't know what to do. Massive army. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Come on, y'all probably prayed the last. Help me, Lord, right? I mean, that's a real prayer. Help us, Lord our God. What does it say? For we what? For what? 
for we rely on you. Don't you know God loves it when you tell him that? But when you actually do it, he loves it even more. We rely on you, and in your name we have come against this vast army, Lord. You are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. And look at verse 12. The Lord struck down the Cushites, that's the enemy, before Asa and Judah. He utterly destroyed the enemy. Totally and absolutely, man, I'm telling you, we rely on the Lord. And this is not just believing God. Relying on him is different. Did y'all know that? I ask y'all who believes God, and of course you're all going to say you believe God. But there's a difference between believing God and having faith. Okay, to rely on him in your life. I'll give you a great illustration. Michael used this at the Brave Conference. And uh, it was probably in that shot when he was so serious. <laughs> but there was a guy, I think in the 1800s, Charles Blondin. He was a tightrope walker. And he set up, uh, he set up this tightrope uh, over at Niagara Falls. And it was a big deal. Everybody came. And that's 1,100 feet, by the way, across. And I think 160 feet deep. So that's a little scary, right? And so all these people were watching him. And he, and he, and he, and he tightropes across the first time. Then he comes back the next time, and people start cheering. You know, then it got progressively harder to do. He would do stunts. Like, he, he took a wheelbarrow, and he took a wheelbarrow across with him. I think in all, it was 21 trips he made. And uh, he was putting weights in the wheelbarrow. And finally, at the end, they were all, look, everybody, uh, he asked them, hey, do y'all believe I can do this? He said, of course, yes, yes. We just saw you do it. But here's the thing. He said, how many want to ride in the wheelbarrow now? <laughs> oh, y'all believe I can do it? Yes. How many want to ride in the wheelbarrow? Silence. Like some of y'all during worship, you know. And uh, <laughs> it's the decongestants, guys. Come on now. I'm going to start taking decongestants every week so I can use that excuse. Yes. Okay. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. There's a big difference, right? They all believed he could do it. We all believe God can do it. We believe his word. But they weren't really willing to rely on him to get the job done. They weren't re- you see the difference? That's what, do you rely on God? Or do you have your, all your nice American systems all set up? Or do you rely on God? Whoo, Lord. Faith, by the way, is a gift of the Spirit, so you can ask him for it. The disciples did. You know what Jesus said? All he needs is a little. Just need a little, little, little bit, just a little bit. Certainly something that was stirred up in, in our trip is that God, this is what I could not shake. God is looking for it. He's waiting on people that will believe. Like, yep, I'm with you. Have y'all heard this verse? I'm not going to put it on the screen. It's in Isaiah. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. You ever heard that? Okay, that's for you, by the way. Because if you keep reading that verse, it says, hey, this is the inheritance of those who are servants of the Lord. All the servants of the Lord. Give the Lord a hand right now. Come on. Servants of the Most High God. Yes. So that's for you. But, listen, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. However, you're going to see the weapon. Boy, I wish I wouldn't have to see what's coming against me. But like Asa, he saw the big army coming against him. You're going to see the threat. You're going to see the impossibility of your situation in your family, at work, whatever. But those who rely on God are going to see the victory as well, you see. Got to understand this. Let me give you some examples. Over there in Brazil, uh, in that one campus, Campo Grande, where they experienced all that growth, where God started the, the move there in 2017. They're building an arena to hold 2,500 people, <laughs> a 2,500-seat arena. Can I just tell you, I mean, that's big for the United States, but in that community, they ain't never seen anything like this. And uh, they, I think we have some pictures of, uh, of, of, of the construction going on. They have about four or $500,000 left to go. And they don't know where it's coming from. And in September, in September, this building is hosting two conferences. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, my friend Philip walks in faith I don't know about, okay? I, I'm, I'm just, but this is, this is the case, okay? So, so uh, our building right here, kind of similar, except thank God ours is finished. Uh, I, I was thinking about, we need space, guys. I'm talking about relying on God. Listen, we... God, we need space for kids, man. We, we need space for offices. It's ridiculous. Some staff run around, no offices. I'm like, oh, oh, you're on staff? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. You don't, you don't have an office, so how would we not? Anyway, forget that. We, we need space, guys. Everybody say space. space. 
We need space for classes. There's so many things I love to do during the middle of services, but we can't do. We have no space. We got to expand, and we're here at the, at the end of a long-term lease, and I don't know what to do. Guess what? I got smart people working on this problem, but I can't just rely on that. I'm not going to just rely. We got to rely on God. It's what the Brazilians teach me. It's what our brothers and sisters teach me. How about you? you do you need some wisdom in decision-making? How about financial decisions? You ever need a wisdom there? Do you rely on God? Who to marry? That's a big one. How about relying on God on that one? You need, you need to rely on God on that? Some people don't like, well, she looks good. Guess I'll marry her. <laughs> rely on God. Career path. How about parents in here whose kids have just gone my local? I mean, just like crazy. That's Portuguese. Just, just, just crazy, man. <laughs> Are you relying on God? Man, I, I, we rely on God as parents. Absolutely. And uh, can I say something to, to the people in here that are a little older than Collide conference age? Can I just talk to you all for a second? Amen. In fact, retired people, y'all look at me. Or people that are old enough to be retired. You know, um, We have a lot of you here in this campus, in this area, and I love it. This word I'm talking about today is not just for young people. We need your faith. This church needs your faith or else we're not going to get it done. Listen to me. Here's what you're fighting, though. I'm going to tell you about a biological, just a chemical process that goes on in our brains. I've experienced this myself. As we get older, we get more averse to taking risks. It's a real chemical process in the brain. Like some of the stuff I was willing to do when I was 20, man, at 54, I'm like, I don't know about that. You know, okay, listen, that... But it seems like it would be the opposite. Like, well, I'm 95 years old now. I just, I, I might as well do whatever because like, what I got to lose, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that, that's the way. That is not how it works, though. It's actually the opposite. And so I'm asking you to fight that. I'm seriously asking you as your pastor to fight that. Faith. Everybody say faith. faith. We need you. We need you. And here's an example. Uh, we are starting an addiction recovery life group next semester. But I was talking to the leaders of that group, and, and they were saying, how cool would it be if we could take some mature believers and just connect them with one-on-one -on -one with younger people that are coming through that addiction recovery, not to help them with their addiction, but just like, like each one of you had somebody that you could help learn how to read the Bible, man, learn how to pray, stuff that you do all the time. But for them, it's groundbreaking. Hey, we need you relying on God for that. You see how we need your faith? 1 John 4, 16 it says, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. So am I so convinced of God's love for me that I can rely on him? Like, that's how I live my life. He, he just loves me so much, I can always rely on him. Is that where I'm at? That's the question I'm asking myself. That's the question you need to ask yourself. Do I have that kind of faith? Y'all ready for the second one? Well, a few of you are. Most of you aren't ready. I don't really give a rip. I'm going to go anyway. Because the first one is this. Listen, the first one is this. Do I rely on God? Right? That's faith. The second one is this, though. Can God rely on me? And that's about faithfulness. So that first question, do I rely on God? Faith. Interestingly enough, faith is a gift of the Spirit. I already talked about that. This one, can God rely on me faithfulness, and that's a fruit of the Spirit. And you get that. You know how you get that? Developing an ongoing, increasingly vibrant relationship with the Lord. Like you just get closer and closer to Him. This is how you, because yeah, anybody you hang out with, you start looking more like. Right? You start acting more like them. Hang out with the Holy Spirit, you start getting more faithfulness, because that's who He is. And can I just talk to you a little bit about a modern trend that I see in our culture? I just want to talk to you about this for a second. And we, we addressed this briefly in our Connect class. Um, but uh, listen, we live in a culture right now that discourages commitment and faithfulness. Right? We do. You tired of your spouse? Get a new one. Only stay at a job long enough until you get that next better offer, you know, just whatever's good. I mean, uh, right? I mean, I, I think you understand. People don't, aren't even committed to their nation, their, their country anymore. I mean, it's just, I'm just telling you we have a culture of non, 
committal people, okay? And uh, it's bled over into the church, right? Into the Christian church in America. As soon as the pastor says something, you know, you don't like, like I've said probably multiple times this morning, um, or, or a person in the church ruffles your feathers a little bit, or, you know, there's some hot new program at the other church or whatever, it's like, you bounce. That's what we do, we bounce. And, and can I just tell you something? That is not the kingdom of heaven. That is our culture. And that is a wrong part of our culture. The kingdom of heaven is a culture of faithfulness. And God rewards faithfulness. Y'all still here? Faithfulness to a church family, of course. Also to your family. Faithfulness to friends. That's what God rewards. Psalm 92, 13. I want to show you this. It says that those who are planted in the house of the Lord. It doesn't say Christians. It doesn't say those who love Jesus. It doesn't apply. The second part doesn't apply to them. Okay? No, it says those who are planted in the house of the Lord. They're in a church family. They shall flourish in the courts of our God. Pastor, I can't seem to move forward. I keep having the same old problems. Where are you planted at? Most of the time, that's the problem. You're not planted anywhere. Um, faithfulness. Everybody say faithfulness. It really comes down to trust. Can God trust you? Brother, is that timer right? Am I really like 45 minutes in? Is that really right? Six minutes past? Okay. Sorry, guys. Oh, well, who cares? Listen. <laughs> Can God trust me? Can God trust you? Luke 16, 10. Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little, remember I talked about little beginnings, right? Whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with what? With much. And if you're not from this church, listen, we, we don't normally go this long, but I'm just telling you right now, this parable that Jesus is saying is huge. I mean, it's talking about money. You go look at it, it's talking about, you know, whether you tithe and give and all that. How you, how you invest the money God's given you. Do you use it for his kingdom, all that. But I think you can apply this to everything God's provided in your life. Whatever you have, like, am I, can God trust me with it, okay? Um, will you be faithful time and time again, even in small beginnings, when the going gets rough? And King Asa, let's look back at him. He was, he was starting to make reforms in the country. Like, he had this big victory, and so he was encouraged, and he was trying to lead everybody, say, hey, we're going to follow God again. He said, I'm going to kill you if you don't. And that's an interesting church strategy, right? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna worship God around here. And, and, and so... So he was using his authority to turn people to God, and a prophet had this to say to him in 2 Chronicles 15, 7. But as for you, Asa, be strong, and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. My goodness. Galatians 6, 9 says the same thing. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, in due season, you will reap a harvest if, if you do not give up. Can God count on me? God honors faithfulness. Listen, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Lord knows I'm not. And I, Philip Murdoch, he's not. He'll admit it. We, you don't have to be the strongest or the fastest, most talented. That's not what matters. You got to be the one that stays standing. When everybody else falls away, I'm going to keep with the dream God's given me. Listen, free life group leaders, keep standing. Serve team leaders, keep standing. All of you help us serve in this, in this community and in this church. Keep standing. Come on, keep going. Be consistent. Be faithful. Be someone your leader can count on. Be somebody God can count on. Faithfulness, man. Parents, keep at it. You're in a marriage that's struggling, keep fighting. Keep standing. Not fighting with your spouse. <laughs> fighting for your spouse. Whatever you believe God has called you to, man, that dream, stick with it. Because like my friends, the Murdochs, they, they've been faithful. And, and they had to change strategy all the time. And they're seeking God continually. But what's happening is God is honoring their faithfulness. That's their story, really. They just didn't give up. They're still there. And God's doing the same in some of your lives. I know it. And God wants to do the same in all of your lives. I know that. But are, are we going to be able to answer those questions? See, those two questions I talked about. Do I rely on God, and can he rely on me? It, it's like they, they weave throughout the fabric of our entire life. And they work together so that God can bring to fruition 
the masterpiece that he says is you. Fitting you, like your plan, the plan he has for your life, fitting it into his master plan for the world. It's all about these two questions. Can God rely on me? Do I rely on him? Let me read this last verse to you, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord, this was to Asa, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those who hearts, whose hearts, whose hearts are fully committed to him. Can you close your eyes, bow your heads, let's pray. Do I rely on God? Can he rely on me? If you have failed in either one of these or both, simply repent today. Come back. Start fresh. Come on, let's pray about this right now. Just people of God in this place, ask God, where do I need faith? Where is it that I need faith in you? Like what area of my life? For some of you, it might be financial. Some of you, it might be a relationship. Some of you may be believing for a miracle. Where do I need to rely on you, God? Where is it? In a moment, you're going to have a chance to have somebody pray for you. Or you can bring a card to the cross. You can write those things down. But just start asking God, where do I need faith? Where do I need that? And Lord, give it to me. I need help because I can't do that. It's a gift from you. Could you help me in this area? I want to be mindful of it. I want to pay attention. Come on, tell him that right now. Or where in my life do I need more faithfulness? Where am I really going awry. Like, uh, man, maybe I used to be faithful in certain things, and again, it could be finances, it could be your family, it could be a church or your ministry, whatever. Lord, where do I need more faithfulness so that you can rely on me in these areas? Just ask them all over this room. Come on, where is it, Lord? God, I pray for New Life Church that, and I just declare this blessing over us, that we're going to be a people that are full of faith. I just declare it right now. Do a work. Do a work, oh God. I declare right now that New Life Church will be filled with members that rely wholeheartedly on you, God. And also that you can rely on us. That we will be faithful, God. Hey, no one else looking around, if you're here and you would say, I am so far from God, I, 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 but right now I, I feel convicted, man, I'm in my sin and I've got guilt. Like one of those students, I read their, their text earlier and you feel the same way, but you're not released from it. You're like, I, Jesus, I need him, but right now I'm not with him. And I, and I want to put my faith in what he did on the cross to make me right with God and give me a brand new life. If there's anybody in here that would say, I need the lordship of God. Maybe I used to know him as Savior, but my goodness, he is not my Lord right now, and I want to recommit my life to him. That's what I want. No one else looking around, would you raise your hand high toward heaven? Come on. You say, I need Jesus in my life. Yeah, I see a couple people. Yeah. Hey, put your hands down and pray this way. Lord, come into my life. I am sorry, God, but I'm repenting right now. I turn to you, a holy God. And Jesus, you're making it possible. I'm relying on you right now and your completed work on the cross and that you rose from the grave to make me right with God in this moment. Lord, I want to be faithful. I want to follow you. Help me do that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.